Well, good afternoon. Uh, you should have received, uh, and I apologize for the lateness of it, but there's a little handout. Hopefully, it'll guide you through. And uh, also have to apologize because after a sermon, I have been given the task to talk about history, and all the kids are like, "No way!" Names, dates, and so forth. But it'll be fun. It'll be fun. Weistreiden vor de Dortzelier. Am dat dia is van hot de hier. Any Dutchman here? The bird who's prayed was Dutch, isn't he? I saw a van. <laughs> so I used to be a Pentecostal, but now that I'm Reformed, I speak in tongues. <laughs> Translated from Dutch, that means uh, we fight for the doctrine of Dort. Because it's from God, the Lord. That was a rallying cry of early 19th century Reformed Christians, brothers and sisters in the Netherlands, as they fought against uh, liberalism and uh, the encroaching tide of indifference towards the doctrines of the Synod and the Canons of Dort. It's also a launching point for us to think about uh, how the doctrines of God's grace and mercy in Jesus Christ are always, some way or another, under assault. The Apostle Paul fought against a kind of legalism in the book of Galatians that some of us have had to fight in our denominations uh, in various strands of so-called federal vision theology. Uh, the apostle also fought against a kind of antinomianism in the book of Romans, or at least responds to that kind of antinomianism that uh, some of us have taken up the pen uh, in recent years against such books as Jesus plus nothing, uh, uh, plus, uh, plus nothing equals everything, excuse me, uh, or One Way Love, you might, uh, you might, uh, those titles might sound familiar to some of you. This might sound strange to us, though, to think about the words fight and grace as the title uh, shows you there why grace was and still is worth fighting for. It might sound strange, but fight and grace in the same sentence. But that's what we just read in Jude's little epistle. Contend. Fight, strive for the faith. Why? Because certain people have crept in who pervert the grace of God. Fight in grace. Historic reformational uh, baptism liturgies say things like this, that we are called as the baptized to, quote, manfully fight under Christ's banner against sin, the world, and the devil, and to continue Christ's faithful soldier and servant unto his life's end. Whenever I read our baptismal form uh, for children or adults, we get to say that we manfully fight against sin, the world, and the devil as Christ's soldiers. I'd like us to travel back in time a little bit uh, this afternoon to the 17th century to a fight to a struggle, uh, a major fight and struggle over theology and spirituality uh, of the grace of Almighty God uh, that culminated in the Synod of Dort, uh, this 400th anniversary year for, uh, for us in the Dutch Reformed tradition. Uh, this, we eat this stuff up, so I'll try to spoon feed uh, my Presbyterian brothers uh, and sisters. Any non-Presbyterians here? Is this, is this like an in-house uh, thing? Okay, well, welcome, welcome. I didn't grow up reformed, so welcome. Uh, so if I'm talking kind of insider baseball here, you'll understand why. But I uh, want to draw us into the story uh, of grace and a fight that's, uh, that was about it. Notice this little theme there for you on the, uh, on the little handout. The story of the Synod of Dort is one full of drama with an eclectic cast of characters, all fighting about the nature of God's grace. As we hear this story unfold, we'll realize that we are participants to joining in that great cloud of witnesses to God's amazing grace, fighting the good fight of the faith, as Paul once exhorted uh, young Pastor Timothy. Well, first of all, the Reformation, uh, as it went down to the Netherlands, uh, the fights at the Synod of Dort, 1618-19, was just one episode in a much larger drama that hit the scene of Europe in what we call the 16th century Protestant Reformation. Uh, the Reformation didn't come out of nowhere. Uh, it didn't even start on October 31st, 1517 with Martin Luther's uh, famous, infamous, uh, we're not quite sure uh, exactly 
uh, how that happened, but his nailing of his theses and were they actually placed in the door. But this debate was rooted in a series of lengthy medieval debates. Uh, in the Netherlands in particular, for a century and a half before the Reformation, there were various reforming movements already uh, afoot within the people of God. The Waldensians fled persecution in northern Italy and in France into the Netherlands. The Lollards from England, those lay preachers, escaped persecution across the channel uh, into the Netherlands. Indigenous to the very Netherlands uh, itself were those who sought a very simple life of faith known as the Brethren of the Common Life. And it's even said by historians that on the eve of the Reformation, Frisian fishermen, any Frieslanders here? Frisian fishermen living in huts could read, write, and discuss the Bible. They didn't only eat their first missionary, but they learned the word, and they could, uh, they could discuss the Bible. That's an inside joke for the Frisians here. Luther translates the Bible into German. It's translated into Dutch, and then some Augustinian monks go to preach the good news as it's been rediscovered in this mysterious land called the Netherlands. And amongst those missionary preachers were the first two Protestant martyrs, Johann Esch and Heinrich Fuss, whom Luther memorialized in this hymn, a new song now shall be begun. Lord, help us raise the banner of praise for all that God has done, for which we give him honor. At Brussels in the Netherlands, God proved himself most truthful and poured his gifts from open hands on two lads, martyrs youthful, through whom he showed his power. The first two Protestant missionaries memorialized in song. At the time of the Reformation in the Netherlands, uh, the Netherlands consisted of 17 independent territories in what we today call the Netherlands, uh, Belgium, northern France, and Luxembourg. Uh, the Holy Roman Emperor was Charles V, and he was a very popular ruler over this aspect of his land holdings. And proving, as we would say, all politics is local, his popularity came from being raised in the Netherlands. He ruled each of these territories not as the, the emperor, but as the local count over each one. And he would appoint stewards, uh, stadtholders, in his place uh, to rule in his place uh, in his absence. He retired from public life in 1556, and he uh, did so to a monastery in Spain, and he passed the baton to his son, Philip II. But what's that phrase we use? The, the apple fell something or other far from a tree, right? The apple fell really, really far from the tree. The peasants despised him because he raised taxes, and he spoke Spanish. Uh-oh. The Catholic nobility despised him because when he tried to reform the church, he ended up taking money out of their coffers. Follow the money, we say in politics. Follow the money. The Protestants despised him because he persecuted. You see, Charles was a Roman Catholic, and he actually enacted various laws in the Netherlands to outlaw the Protestant faith. But he never strictly applied his own laws. Philip did. He forbade reading and possessing forbidden books, worshiping outside of the Roman church, talking openly or secretly about the scriptures, teaching the Bible, unless you graduated from one of his government-sanctioned universities. The penalty for a male confessor, if you confessed that you did any of those things, the penalty was the sword. If you were female, You'd be buried alive. If you didn't confess, what do you think would happen to you? What was the worst punishment you can get in the, in the reformational period? The stake, right? Burned alive at the stake. And in fact, Philip said, if you were found out later uh, that you didn't tell that your neighbor was a Protestant or was reading the Bible and they found out later that he was a heretic and that you didn't tell. There was punishment waiting for you too. Death. 
Now, tensions boiled over in the year 1566, and there are famous paintings and uh, wonderful uh, uh, art about this called the Bildenstorm, which was uh, uh, a wave of public iconoclasm that uh, the reformers would go through the cities and they were trashing statues of the Virgin Mary. They were crashing church buildings and knocking down their iconography and their stained glass windows. Those of you old enough, you can cue the Monty Python skits. Nobody expects the Spanish Inquisition. Nobody expects the Spanish Inquisition. Philip persecuted even worse. He, would, he said that he would rather rule over a nation. Uh, he would rather see the Netherlands destroyed than rule over a nation of heretics. It's my way or the highway. The reports vary, but somewhere between 2,000 or 100,000, depending on the source, uh, Protestants were put to death. Now, what happens in the world of politics and even religion? Uh, when, when there's a political action, there's always an equal and opposite reaction, right? Uh, and so resistance to this harsh, hardline, heavy-handed persecution uh, coalesced in the year 1572 uh, under uh, the very uh, powerful, uh, now the, the now patron saint, William of Orange, the leading noble in this region of the Netherlands. But William was kind of an irony as a man. He was the son of the Count of Nassau, which was in a region that spoke German, uh, just over the border. Uh, he himself ruled over the House of Orange, which was in France, just over the border. Yet he was to become the leader of a Dutch nation. The Dutch national anthem actually enshrines this strange irony. Do my Dutch brothers and sisters want to join me in singing the Het Wilhelmus? No? Wilhelmus <laughs> van Asawa, Benedict van Deutzen Blut. I had to memorize that for my ordination. <laughs> Just kidding. William of NASA am I of German blood. That's the opening line of the Dutch national anthem, even today. William of NASA am I of German blood. So he became this powerful leader uh, over this uh, group that was coalescing with religious and political power and fervor. But if you poke a bear, what happens? If you poke a bear, what's going to happen? The bear going to run away? You're going to get bit. That's what's going to happen. Spain was Europe's superpower. And so William needed allies. And so we asked his neighboring German uh, friends and princes for aid. And they said, sure, we'll come to your aid. But what do you think German-speaking Protestants told William? You've got to become a Lutheran. You've got to convert to Lutheranism. So he goes over to France and he writes letters and sends emissaries to the Huguenots led by uh, Coligny, the, the great uh, military leader. And he agreed to come to their aid with thousands of soldiers, but yet he first had to go to a wedding. I would come and help. Uh, we're, we're gonna, we're gonna uh, stay this tide of persecution, but there's a wedding I've got to go to. Uh, between Henri of Navarre, the, the, the king of Navarre, and uh, the sister of the Roman Catholic king of uh, France. We're trying to uh, heal our own divides here and bring uh, the end to religious war. But since all's fair in love and war, the Roman Catholics rose up and murdered over 6,000 Protestants uh, that one single day. And so help from the Huguenots was out. Uh, William had only one person to turn to, which was uh, Queen Elizabeth of England. And she was already at war with Philip. And... Uh, no doubt she probably reasoned that the enemy of my enemy is my friend, as we say. And so she gave just enough military and financial aid to keep the Spanish away from her borders uh, and occupied there in the Netherlands. Now, what happened is that uh, the 17 provinces began to take sides. And 10 of them in the south, which is today uh, Bel mostly Belgium, uh, the, these 10 southern Romanist provinces united. And so the seven northern reformed provinces united. Uh, and Philip then sent an army into the city of Leiden, which is right in the middle of that northern territory, trying to cut it off in half. If he, can, if he could besiege Leiden, cut Leiden off, 
Uh, the southern part of that, those seven provinces will be divided from the northern part, and he would divide and conquer, uh, and it was all she wrote. William's army wasn't big enough to end the siege of Leiden. And so he did the thing that all military legends do. He had a plan. He convinced the city officials in Leiden behind their city walls with the Spanish army outside of it. They were starving. They were cold. Uh, they were dying by the plague and so forth. But he convinced the city leaders to put out the fires of this siege by unplugging the dikes and flooding the city. What a, what a great strategy. What a great strategy. Flood your city to end a siege. Why would he do that? Because William had a navy. He had a navy. And so they flood the city. He rushes in with his navy and they fight in the city on water. They and their ships, the Spanish floating on barrels or whatever they can find to survive. And they won. They won. In, uh, in, uh, for a reward, uh, William offered the city leaders of Leiden perpetual non-taxation. What a great reward. <laughs> Perpetual, I'm from California, perpetual non-taxation. What an amazing thing. No, they asked for a university instead. What a weird answer. Cue the foreboding music, though. We're going to see that university in just a moment. So they asked for this university, uh, the University of Leiden. So these new United Seven Provinces reject officially in 1582 the rule of Philip II of Spain. And the leadership becomes sort of a political hot potato. Nobody wants to take ownership of these seven provinces because you're then going to be a marked man. Eventually, William of, uh, of Orange was named Stadhuder, which is the steward. He's steward of the Netherlands, but he's assassinated in 1584. Uh, his son was a military leader, Prince Maurits, uh, or Morris in English, Prince Morris. Uh, he becomes the steward, and another man named Johann van Oden Barnefeld became uh, the Lands Advocat, which is uh, uh, the, the chairman of the Republican government. Political peace, reformation takes root, and everyone lives happily ever after, right? Everyone lives happily ever after. There's a Christian prince, reformed leaders, the Spanish are drowned, everyone lives happily ever after, but it was no fairy tale. It was no fairy tale. Decades of struggle ensue. And so every story needs a boogeyman, doesn't it? Struggle. And it all comes to a head in this man, Jacob Hermanson. Jacob, the son of Herman. You might know him as James Arminius. Jacob, Jacobus Arminius. He was an orphan, in fact. It's always important to put humanity to those that we would consider a theological foe. He was, a, he was an orphan at an early age. His father died in the war against Spain. His mother died uh, soon thereafter. He was raised by a caretaker. Uh, he then died, and so he experienced much death and tragedy as a, young, uh, as a boy and a young man. He was sent off to grammar school in the city of Marburg uh, in Germany, and he returned to the Netherlands as the 12th student to sign up at that new university at Leiden, in fact. And so he studied there for six years. And then, as it was in those days, the city officials, uh, the merchant guild, uh, they would find uh, gifted and talented young men to send off to university to study for the ministry. And so they funded his Peregrinatio Academica, his academic pilgrimage. For six years, he traveled to Geneva, Basel, and Padua to study, to prepare himself for the ministry. In fact, when he finished his studies after six years, one of his professors wrote him a very glowing letter of recommendation to the church in Amsterdam. And, the, and that recommendation says this, quote, God has gifted him with an apt intellect, both as respects the apprehension and the discrimination of things. Unquestionably, unquestionably, so far as we are able to judge, he's most worthy of your kindness and liberality. That's what Theodore Beza said about Arminius. 1588, he became 
one of the many pastors of the Collegiate Reformed Church in Amsterdam. That means that uh, cities, uh, the whole city was reformed, and so there were multiple churches throughout the city. They were ruled by one overseeing consistory, that's a body of pastors and elders, and the, the pastors would rotate Sunday by Sunday throughout the various local parishes or the local congregation. And so Arminius became one of the many ministers of the collegiate church in Amsterdam and rotating around uh, in his preaching ministry. Now, like all good young Reformed preachers, where did he begin his sermons? As, as a good young Reformed preacher right out of seminary, where should you start preaching? Come on, Reformed people. Where do all Reformed people start their preaching at? Romans? Anybody? Romans? Is it just me or is it, is Romans not, 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 not the place you start? I guess that's, maybe it's not anymore. He starts in the book of Romans. Like all good young Reformed preachers, because who doesn't want to preach the doctrines of grace? He begins in the book of Romans. But it didn't take long for his preaching to cause controversy. And no doubt, uh, those of us who've, who, who've preached long enough can remember uh, and still maybe have ourselves, a certain amount of angst as a young preacher. You go out to save the world. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of Christ with great optimism. But as soon as he gets into chapter number two of the book of Romans, he's already filled with disappointment. And he says in one of his sermons that his hearers, quote, would have been better off if they had remained in the Roman Catholic Church. Because then at least... You would be doing good works in the hope of everlasting reward. But now you do nothing. He was disappointed as people were just sort of let go and let God nonchalant Calvinists. He got to Romans chapter 5 and he said that death was inevitable even if Adam had obeyed the, law, uh, the Lord's commands. 1591, he really steps in it in Romans chapter 7, and he evidences his move away from the Augustinian tradition. He said that Paul was not speaking in Romans 7 of the unregenerate man. The good that I want, I don't, and the things that I don't want to do, I do. That's not the regenerate man, excuse me, but that's the unregenerate man. That's the struggle, he said, of the one who's yet to come to Christ. In 1592, we got to Romans chapter number 9. And the water got even hotter. Jacob I loved. Esau I hated. I mean, what's to go wrong in that little phrase? Jacob, not Jacob, but the class of Jacobites. Esau, not Esau, but the class of Esauites, that is, believers and unbelievers. Romans 9, he said, was not speaking of individual election, but we would describe it today sort of anachronistically as a class election, a, a corporate election. And so his senior colleague on the consistory, Petrus Palancius, protests to the consistory, the ruling body, and they investigate Arminius. Because again, he's rotating around. All the elders are not hearing all these sermons. People are starting to complain. They haul him in to the consistory room, to the elders' room, and they investigate him, and he says he agrees. He agrees, though, with what the Belgic Confession of Faith says in Article 16 about predestination. That's one of our confessions. Article 16 speaks very simply and powerfully about God's justice and God's mercy as being revealed in the doctrine of predestination. And he says, I agree with the doctrine as it's laid out in our confessions, but I assert my own right to interpret it as I see fit. Isn't that how all heretics say it? <laughs> I agree, but it's my own little interpretation of it. Fast forward a few years, 1602 to 1603, the plague. The plague hits the Netherlands, uh, and in particular the city of Leiden. And there are three theological professors at the University of Leiden, and the plague wipes out two of them. Guess who survived? Guess who survived? Arminians. Uh, 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 Franciscus Homaris, excuse me. Uh, Homaris is the only surviving faculty member. Uh, and not wanting a good crisis to go to waste. That's the big, one of the political terms we've heard recently. 
uh, not wanting a good crisis to go to waste, the avant-garde members of the government, they appoint Arminius to the faculty alongside of Homaris. And that concerns a few people. And so Homaris, being a, being a good theologian, being a godly man, agrees to interview and intervene uh, to meet with Arminius to sort of assuage the, the concerns. And he comes out of that meeting and he declares that, uh, that, that everything is fine. He sees nothing wrong with Arminius' theology. He was satisfied with his, with his interview. But only a couple years later, there are questions about Arminius. His reading lists that he published for his students had too many Roman Catholic texts. Interesting comment. Uh, too many Roman Catholic books. Others said that his public lectures at Leiden weren't quite matching private conferences he was having with some students on the side. So he had his public class, then he had a special select of the elect, we might say. Students on the side. And some students even said things like this. I observe among a number of fellow students enrolled in the private theological class of Dr. Arminius many things that, had I been ignorant, might easily have led me into dark and abominable error. People are starting to see through, see through the, the whole thing. Homaris uh, was convinced that the issue with Arminius was that he was undermining the chief article of the church, the article by which the church stands or falls, that we are justified not by faithfulness, but by the means of faith in Jesus Christ. Because a foreseen faith, election based upon foreseen faith, turns faith into a work. Homaris said it like this, I would not dare to appear before God's throne if I believe what Arminius believes. It wasn't about predestination, limited atonement, irresistible grace, total depravity, perseverance. It was about the gospel, according to Homaris. I would not dare appear before God's throne if I believed what Arminius does. And so many ministers, concerned ministers, began calling for a national synod of all the Reformed churches in the Netherlands. This is like the early 1600s. The last synod, the last general assembly, was decades before in 1586. But in 1586, the Dutch churches agreed that every, every three years there was going to be a synod. But because the politicians didn't want one, the churches were unable to meet. And so for decades, they are, they are synodless. And congregationalism begins to rear its little ugly heads. The nobles, the politicians, run Arminius' side, who in fact was married to uh, the daughter of a very prominent merchant uh, in Amsterdam. It reminds us that all the theological struggles were political struggles and vice versa. There was no invisible wall of separation uh, as we have uh, that conception in our context here. And so Reformed ministers were seeking to determine whether or not Arminius himself was confessional. And they were, they were seeking to assert the right of the church to depose ministers without the state's approval. That's what they were fighting for. To determine whether or not Arminius was confessional and to assert their right as church to meet and to adjudicate their own things in their own realm. Now, there were those who believed the government had authority over the church. Uh, they were called politikane, uh, the politicals. Uh, those who believed the church had authority over its matters were called kerkeleiken, the, the ecclesiasticals, the, the, church, the churchly folks. And so the church, uh, 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 the government sponsored a, a meeting between Arminius and Homaris, two times, in fact, 1607, 1609. These conferences were, were trying to iron out the issues and the details. Nothing was settled, and it all came to a screeching halt in 1609 when Arminius died. Now, I have to say that from all accounts that I've read, Arminius was reported to be a very humble and godly man who wasn't out to seek controversy. Uh, he said about various of his own theological theses on free will that he, quote, composed them in a guarded manner because I thought that they would thus conduce to peace. 
Here we are 400 years later with our slogans and labels, Arminian, Calvinist, and so forth. But these are real men. Uh, again, he was a human being. He was orphaned. He suffered much tragedy. Uh, he was seemingly a godly man. Those that we might flippantly call heretics, false teachers, and so forth, could have been just as godly as our heroes, although we disagree. Now, the death of Professor Arminius didn't end the fight. It never does. It never does. Professors have their loyal students who go out to change the world. And so in January 1610, soon after their leader, Arminius, dies, 43 ministers gather together in the city of Chauda. Anybody like Gouda cheese? The city of Gouda, Chauda. They gathered in that city to write this petition. And they crossed a theological Rubicon. Uh, they were led by, a, by the court preacher uh, to uh, uh, the Stadthouder, the, uh, the, the steward of the Netherlands. They were led by this court preacher. Uh, they were supported by that political man, Jan van Oldenbarneveldt. And they prepare a document with five little points. And that document was called the Remonstrance, a public protest. And so their party of ministers becomes known as the Remonstrance, with a T, Remonstrance, Remonstrance. They call themselves, though, Reykjavikin, moderates. They call their opponents Precision, precisionists. Nitty gritty, straining at gnats kind of Calvinists. We're the moderates, they're the precisionists. Now, like all good Calvinists, uh, the response was a day late and a dollar short. Arminius is dead, 1609. Uh, January 1610, they've already written a five point protest of the government. We, we just want to be uh, uh, allowed to teach this and be tolerated. It's not until 1611 that the quote-unquote good guys respond. So it's a day late and a dollar short. And what do they call their response? Wait for it. Counter-remonstrance. So, uh, so witty, right? <laughs> so clever. Now that led to meetings between the various, the, these two sides in the year 1611, but to no avail. You can begin to see a pattern here. There's to no avail every time. They meet to no avail. They meet to no avail. Uh, and because a synod wasn't being called, uh, those precision or those precisionist Calvinist reformed people in the pews, they begin to move Sunday by Sunday from parish congregation to congregation to avoid the remonstrant preachers. And so on certain Sundays, this church was a ghost town. The next Sunday, was, the rafters were full. People were hanging from, from the ceiling because a Calvinist was there, a good confessional Calvinist. That led to riots in the streets. Imagine that. On the Lord's Day, riots in the streets over where you went to church. What a, what a day that must have been, huh? <laughs> we go to church. We go home, right? Nothing to do about much. We go home. Uh, in, in, in 1615, these precisionists, as they were called, the, the Reformed, uh, they began to meet in, for worship outside the city walls. And there began to be rumors of a secret synod that was going to be held for all these to leave the state-sponsored church. And so it's, it's seemingly chaos, riots, uh, pressure, stress. The government is falling apart. The church is falling apart. Everything's on fire, as it were. And uh, Leiden had a, uh, a teacher of philosophy, Petrus Cuneus, who said the theologians had introduced this strife into what we would call the social media platforms of the day. The theologians brought strife into barbershops, into boats, into wagons, into theaters. That led Dudley Carleton, who was the English ambassador to the Netherlands, to call this, quote, our civil war, which is prosecuted with much incivility 
as appears by many railing and scoffing libels. The Netherlands was chaos. That summer in 1617, Prince Mauritz aligned himself with these so-called precisen, these precisionist class, uh, these confessionally reformed people. And it was reported that Prince Mauritz, the, uh, he's the, uh, the steward of the Netherlands, that he didn't know whether or not predestination was blue or green, but he was going to make it orange. He was the ruler of the House of Orange. He didn't know whether it was green or blue, but he was going to make it orange. In response, uh, Jan van Olden Barnefeldt, who was the chairman of the Republican government, he rallied two of the seven provinces to his side, and they stated in no uncertain terms, no national synod was going to be held, and our, uh, our, our territories are going to raise militias to prevent people traveling to any called synod of the, of the national church. But Mauritz proved that it was better to speak softly and carry a big stick. He had a standing army. Van Olden Barnefeldt had a couple of militias. Mauritz was a battle-hardened soldier. He had an army behind him. And so he disarmed the militias in July 1618, and that paved the way to the national, uh, the states general, the national government, to call for a synod. But keep in context that this is a fledgling reformed republic, a fledgling and fractured reformed church on the verge of civil war. And all the while, I failed to mention, in the year 1621, just around the corner, Spain was preparing to re-enter war with the Netherlands. Back when they had severed themselves and they had uh, uh, become their own nation, there was a 12 years truce between the Dutch and the Spanish. And that 12 years was coming to an end in 1621. So a couple of, in a couple of years, there was going to be not just civil war, but there's going to be war here with Spain, the great superpower of Europe. Jan, uh, Van Olden Barnefeldt was arrested, and he was executed toward the end of the synod, in fact, later on. Uh, and uh, the, uh, the Genevan, the Italian Genevan theologian, Giovanni Diodati, uh, he had this little grim play on words when, when uh, Van Olden Barnefeldt, the leader of uh, the Arminian party, uh, when he was executed, his head was cut off. He said this, dat des canons van de synodi den advocate het hoft haden af hersoten. The canons of the synod have shot off the advocate's head. The Dutch canons with a C uh, is a homonym of canons with a K. Uh, to, 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 to say the canons with a C refers to rules or these regulations, whereas canon uh, the other one is speaking of guns. And so he made this little play on words. The cannons of Dort shot off Van Alden Barnefeld's head. That was the kind of humor they had back then. <laughs> now, this decision to have a national synod, that's our fourth point on the outline for keeping score. Uh, this becomes an opportunity for an international synod, in fact. And this was at the urging of King James of England. In fact, uh, the French themselves, the, the national French church, uh, they themselves had been advocating for a decade plus for, a national, for an international synod for all the reformed churches of, the, uh, of Europe to gather together in one place, write one confession of faith, and unite theologically and politically against the Holy Roman Emperor. So this national synod becomes a chance for an international synod. And that's what makes the Synod of Dort not just an important event in Dutch history, but in the history of the church. And so the States General, the, the, uh, the national government of the Netherlands, sent invites to reformed principalities and princes across Europe to send their best and brightest theologians to settle the fight and to put their money where their mouth was, the States General of the Netherlands offered to pay the whole cost of all the international delegates. One remonstrant, one Arminian quipped that each cannon written at Dort cost one ton of gold. 
He said that not happily. <laughs> and so invites were sent out. They were sent directly. Uh, this invitation was sent directly to King James uh, in England. Invites were sent to the National Church in France, the National Synod in France, uh, Brandenburg, the Palatinate, from which the Heidelberg Catechism comes, Hesse, Nassau, Vetterau, uh, Bremen, Emden, Geneva, and several Swiss cantons. Unfortunately, the National Synod of France and the Brandenburgers could not attend. Uh, although France's king, Louis XIII, initially, he was a Roman Catholic, but he was initially favorable to sending delegates uh, as a means of promoting French-Dutch unity against a common enemy, Spain, he ultimately reneged uh, and said that the delegates that the National Synod had sent, there were four of them, that if they left, if they went over the border, that they would not let, uh, be let back in the country. In fact, two of them got as far as Geneva. They traveled backwards to, to get around uh, into the Netherlands. Uh, they got as far as to uh, Geneva, and a letter was sent to them saying, this, uh, saying to that effect that they were not allowed to return back if they stepped foot out of French soil. Uh, one, of their, one of the delegates was the celebrated Pierre de Moulin, who, uh, who, although was not there, influenced the synod through his letters. Uh, the delegates from Brandenburg, uh, in modern-day Germany, also were unable to attend because one of their delegates, Christoph Pelargis, became sick. Uh, but most importantly, the Margrave uh, Georg Wilhelm, the, the, the ruler of uh, Brandenburg, he didn't want to strain his relationship with his Lutheran neighbors. Uh, so. They were not allowed uh, to send delegates. And so the Synod of Dort honored the French and the Brandenburgers. Uh, if you see that, uh, that image, that's that photo, that, that, uh, that reprint outside, that's like the holy relic area over there. There's the, the 1620 edition of, uh, uh, of the Acts of the Synod of Dort, and there's that image above it. If you look in the very back of that, to the right, you'll see uh, the English are sitting there in the prime position. Aren't the English always in the prime position? Uh, and uh, in some of the early uh, imagery, there was a canopy over because there's a bishop sitting there. Uh, next to that, you'll see an empty bench. The high bench was for the French. They were the second place of prominence. And just below them, another empty bench. That was where Brandenburg was supposed to sit. And so the synod honored them, uh, although they were not uh, in attendance. Other Reformed churches were also not invited. It's always interesting to learn not just things that were done and said, but things that weren't done and said. Uh, there, were, there were Dutch churches called Strangers Churches in London, in fact. But if you're going to invite Presbyterians who are under the protection of the Episcopal Church of England uh, to come over to this synod, things might get just a little bit awkward, don't you think? If you're going to ask for Presbys to come over and uh, to sort of thumb their nose at the Episcopalians, so it wasn't kosher to do that. So they, they didn't ask the Dutch Strangers Church uh, in London to send any delegates. Uh, there were also Dutch churches in the western border regions, on the border of the Netherlands and, and Germany, but they were surrounded by Lutherans. They were surrounded by the, Roman, the Holy Roman Empire, the Roman Catholic Church. Uh, there was also the Hungarian Reformed uh, Church at the, other, at the other end of Europe, uh, the churches in the western kingdom of Hungary were under the Catholic Habsburg dynasty. Those in the eastern principality of Transylvania were under uh, Muslim Ottoman rule. And so, uh, and uh, there was the, uh, there was a famous uh, death in 1618, the defenestration of Prague, uh, where someone was thrown out of a window, and that led to the Thirty Years' War. So uh, the Hungarians were out too. Now, the Synod hosted 84 delegates, and they met in a retrofitted building. This building was called the Cloveniers Dulin, which is uh, the Musketeers shooting range. Perhaps the irony didn't escape them. They were meeting in a shooting range. I'm assuming here in the South, there's a lot of guns, right? We all know what a shooting range is. They met in a shooting range that was retrofitted to house a synod. Interesting. Uh, there are 58 uh, delegates who were from, uh, who are, in, who are theolo uh, theologi and theory, who were from the Dutch, uh, the Walloon-speaking churches within the Netherlands. There were 26 theologi ex theory, uh, international delegates. And they were seated, as I mentioned, according to prestige. And that image that you see out there, you looked at the very back and you looked at the left, the far left, the far front, that's where the political delegates from the Netherlands sat. 
Uh, and then just uh, closer to us in the, in the image, a little bit further from the front, uh, prime sort of pole position. Uh, uh, next to them were the theological delegates from the Dutch uh, seminaries. Then the Dutch uh, provincial synods, their regional gatherings. The Walloon-speaking synod that represented the churches under the cross, the persecuted Christians and Spanish uh, ruled southern Netherlands, and so even they uh, sent delegates, as well as the Landschap, or the independent territory of Drenth, also sent delegates. Uh, the, these external theologians were really a who's who of preachers and theologians, and there were also some ruling elders as well. Uh, one Dutch theologian said that this was a muster of the forces of Calvinism. Another sort of ironic phrase, the muster, right? The cannons, the guns that shut off the advocate's head are going to be uh, determined here. From England, and let's focus on England for a few moments here, uh, came the synod's only bishop. There was a bishop there. Uh-oh. I'm just the messenger here, people. Don't shoot me. There was a bishop in attendance, George Carleton, a uh, bishop from Wales, uh, he's actually called in various diaries of various delegates, he's, he's, he's just called the bishop. Whenever they speak about Carlton, it's the bishop. Uh, he had an entourage, like all bishops do, uh, of eight to ten with him. Uh, he stayed in his own lodging. They were all housed throughout the city of Dortrecht. Uh, and, uh, but the bishop had his own house, and it was called the Little Synod because he would host various delegations. Whenever there were tensions amongst the delegates, the bishop would bring them in uh, and smooth over tensions. Uh, the bishop also spoke first. Whenever the, whenever the British delegates were called upon the public session to speak and give their opinion, the bishop always spoke first. Uh, and I mentioned in that image, I didn't look to see if this is the same one, but there is a version of that image of the Synod of Dort uh, that has uh, the English delegates sitting under a green canopy. Uh, that was to symbolize his authority as bishop. And when the synod processed through the streets of Dortrecht at the end, when they affirmed these canons of Dort, the bishop, George Carleton, led uh, at the head of the entourage of all the foreign delegates. So he was given prime position. Uh, he was honored uh, to a fault uh, to show honor and respect to King James because, of course, the, the Netherlands need allies. They need friends. There's also Joseph Hall, who was, uh, who was a dean, uh, in England, uh, he was afterwards the Bishop of Exeter in Norwich. Uh, John Davenant, who, was, uh, 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 who became a great theologian uh, and at the Synod itself was a great writer uh, and thinker. Uh, the Synod, uh, after it began, the Synod, uh, King James sent uh, a man by the name of Walter Balkan Quahal, who was uh, the de facto representative of the Church of Scotland, although he was a fellow at Pembroke Hall, Cambridge. He was the de facto Scottish delegate. Uh, the diaries call him Scotus. He's the Scot, Scotus. Uh, after the synod began, Joseph Hall, one of the delegates, became ill. And in fact, uh, three, uh, three delegates died. So, you know, young ministers, you get delegated to a general assembly, you know, it's a little bit of a risk. Right? You might die at General Assembly. Three of these men died. Not the English, but three delegates died. Uh, they got sick. They, they couldn't handle the damp, cold, wet air uh, of the Netherlands, apparently. And so Hall got ill. He requested of King James to return back to England. He was sent back. Uh, the delegates that existed there from the British, they requested that King James replace him with a man named Thomas Goad. He was chaplain to the Archbishop of Canterbury. But uh, it's interesting that behind the scenes in the various letters, uh, uh, ambassador Dudley Carleton, ambassador to the Netherlands from King James, he campaigned for another very famous Cambridge theologian, uh, John Prideau. Uh, and he says this, not only for the sufficiency uh, of the man, but also uh, for the reputation of the University of Oxford, uh, as he uh, was, was a professor at Oxford at the time. Uh, and he said, uh, at this time, you know, we have Davenants, we have Wards, we have Balkanqual. They're all from Cambridge. We need an Oxford man here. Cheerleading for your alma mater is nothing new. People like their, 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 their favorite seminaries, right? So they're cheerleading behind the scenes for a certain man. Uh, from the Palatinate, that's where the Heidelberg Catechism comes. 
uh, my beloved catechism, uh, Abraham Skoltetus, who was a minister, a professor, he was the royal chaplain in the Palatinate, uh, Johann Heinrich uh, Alting, a professor in Heidelberg, he was the inspector of the Collegium Sapientiae, the, uh, the school of, of, of wisdom there in Heidelberg. Uh, the, uh, the most eminent of the Palatinate theologians was unable to attend, David Piraeus. Uh, he couldn't travel due to his age and his uh, illness, but he sent letters, a uh, very famous letter, in fact, to the Synod to give his advice. Uh, and in his place, another man by the name of Paulus Tosanus uh, sat uh, in his place. Uh, from, from, the, from the region of Hesse, the oldest member of Synod, uh, there is a 23-year-old man at the Synod, actually a 22-year-old man who was a political delegate from the Netherlands, a 22-year-old man, all the way up to a 71-year-old uh, delegate, Rudolf Gaclenius the Elder uh, from Hesse. He was a professor of physics, logic, mathematics, and ethics. I guess they didn't specialize back then in systematics, historical, exegetical, right? <laughs> I went on uh, uh, prdl.org, the post-reformation uh, post digital library, and I think I saw like 282 Latin works of logic and physics and mathematics uh, by Rudolf Gaclenius the Elder. 71 years old, made it to the Senate. Uh, the Swiss republics sent uh, very important men. Uh, the chief preacher from the Gross Munster, the great church uh, in Zurich, Johann Jakob Breitinger, uh, was a delegate. From Basel, Switzerland, uh, Sebastian Beck, Wolfgang Meyer, uh, professors of Old Testament and dogmatics. Uh, Marcus Rutemeyer, who was the rector of the Bern Academy, uh, and from the, the region of Schaffhausen, Johann Conrad Koch, who was the minister of the cathedral. Uh, so there was a cathedral preacher as well at uh, the synod. Uh, the, the Genevans just quickly sent a uh, uh, famous uh, Yo, uh, Giovanni Diodati, uh, celebrated Italian refugee pastor who succeeded Theodore Beza uh, at the synod. He's the one who gave that little quip about uh, the advocate's head being shot off. Uh, and from the Republic of Bremen came a man named Matthias Martinius. He was the rector and professor of the gymnasium, uh, the school there in uh, Bremen, but he was most known for being challenged twice on the floor of the synod by Franciscus Homaris, that first advocate and then adversary of Arminius. Twice challenged to a duel on the floor of synod. And in fact, I, I was, I, I, I've heard the story, and so I went and pulled out uh, uh, my copy of uh, the, the Acta of the Synod of Dort, and there I found it in that Latin text, and it actually says that, uh, he ch uh, that uh, Homaris challenged Martinius to a duel. The chairman, seeing things getting a little bit out of hand, <laughs> called for the order of the day, led in prayer, Everybody calmly prayed, and immediately after the prayer, he stood up again, challenged him to a duel. Smarter heads prevailed. So you'd be like uh, Ryan and I, all of a sudden, you know, we're going to pull, pull out our swords. Uh, I'm not sure if it, was like, if it was a pistol or if it was a sword, but we're going to duel it out right here. We're going to figure this out right here, right now. Okay, scooters or skateboards, right? Which one's better? So... He was a great theologian in his own right, but he's most infamously known as being challenged to a duel twice. So the Synod had an opening ceremony. Uh, they, they, they had a time of prayer in Dutch and in French. Uh, the Dutch delegates, of course, would have uh, huddled together, and the rest, no doubt, would have spoken French. And so that was for the international delegates, uh, the more refined language of the two, right? French as opposed to Dutch. Uh, uh, pr the president was uh, Johannes Bogerman, uh, one of the great Dutch figures with an epic beard down to his waist, uh, even farther down than that. Uh, he made a public vow at the very opening of the synod. I will new use no human writing, but only the word of God, which is an infallible rule of faith. I will only aim at the glory of God, the peace of the church, and especially the preservation of the purity of doctrine. And he had a personal advisor alongside of him, the entirety of the synod, William Ames. You might know that name. William Ames, the, uh, the exiled English Puritan, 
uh, was there as uh, a polemicist. He had written a very famous anti-remonstrant polemical work, and so he was there as an advisor uh, to the president. Uh, there was what were called the, the, the pro-acta, the before the acts of synod took place. Uh, the synod was in session, and the remonstrants were yet to arrive. They were late. Uh, they were, in fact, meeting in Rotterdam uh, themselves as a synod, trying to figure out how to respond. And so the synod dealt with things like catechism instruction of children, preparation for the ministry. Dr. Piper mentioned some of these things earlier. Uh, the baptism of slaves throughout the Dutch colonies. Book censorship, in fact. Uh, a new Dutch Bible translation that became the, the great sort of equivalent to King James, the Statenvertaling, uh, 1637, when it was finally finished, uh, the great Dutch Bible. Uh, the Acta, or the Acts of Synod, dealt with the actual remonstrant issue, the, th the, the, the issue of Arminianism. And, and uh, uh, I was going back and I looked at the, uh, the list of delegates and 15 remonstrants were cited to appear. They were, they were charged to appear before the synod. 14 ministers and one elder. Um, I don't think this reflects on all elders, but this elder, tail was between his legs, and uh, the synod began and he, he went home. <laughs> he gave up his remonstrant position, he saw what was gonna happen, and, uh, and he left. So uh, his, his, uh, his wits came about him. 14 pastors, though. So I want you to think about this just for a quick uh, minute. 14 pastors, remonstrant Arminian preachers, and all within the order of the Reformed Church in the Netherlands, but 14 of them were preachers. Um, four of them were pastor's kids. Four of them were pastor's kids. All of them were educated at Reformed, what we would call seminaries, universities. In fact, 11 of them came from Leiden, where... Arminius had taught. So four pastor's kids, 11 at this one university. Doesn't take much to spoil the whole bunch, does it? One bad apple spoils the whole bunch. All because of one man, all this controversy. And just because you're a pastor's kid doesn't mean you have a right to, uh, to orthodoxy either. It has to be guarded and preserved. Their strategy was to divide and conquer. They came finally to the synod and uh, one of their, uh, their leaders, Simon Episcopius, uh, gave several long diatribes and discourses uh, trying to divide the body by starting with the controversial topic of reprobation, the hardest doctrine, uh, the most controversial doctrine, trying to delay and to divide. It didn't work. Uh, the, the, uh, the English ambassador to the Netherlands, again, uh, Dudley Carleton, said in uh, one of his letters, the remonstrants have been remorantes. The remonstrants have been delaying. They've been remorantes. Episcopius gave several long speeches I mentioned, and one of them included the argument that the synod had no right to judge the Arminians. But the irony wasn't lost on Johannes Bogerman, the, the chairman. By the way, he was a Frisian, so he had a very boisterous personality, and that comes out in the minutes. Uh, he reminded the remonstrants that the synod was convened by the state. He'd been complaining, this synod has no right over us. Aren't you the ones that have been advocating for decades that, the, this, that, that the, the state runs the church? The state's called our synod. Of course it has a right to judge. The proceedings were bogging down even more so, so by January 1, 1619, the state's general, the, federal, uh, the, the national government, told the remonstrants if they would not cooperate then their doctrine was going to be judged by their writings. And so they began to summarize their writings and various theses and documents and circulate them around the delegates to get a handle on what they were teaching and saying. Uh, Ambassador Carleton sent a list of theses back to England and Archbishop George Abbott said, quote, I stand amazed at their absurdness, for they make a hodgepodge of religion borrowing some things from a few Lutherans, but many things from the Papists, the semi-Pelagians, and the Pelagians themselves. King James even said in a letter, he was, quote, marvelously inflamed against these graceless positions. That was King James. The synod got nowhere. Two weeks later, January 14th, 1619, Johannes Bogerman, the Frisian, Famously barked, Dimitimini exite. 
Get out. <laughs> You're dismissed. Get out now. There's a famous moment where the remonstrants, the Arminians, have now for 400 years said, you know, the synod never dealt with them, with us, fairly. Bogermann barked, dimitimini exite, get out. That's how we were treated. Well, it was a bad response to a difficult situation. So in response, as they were sent out, the delegates then formed a committee to produce a draft of the canons of Dort. There were three foreign delegates on that committee, Bishop Carlton, of course, the bishop, uh, Diodati and Scoltatus from Heidelberg, three Dutch theologians, Polyander, Trigland, and Wallaeus, uh, the president himself, Bogermann, and his two vice chairmen, Falkilius and Rolandes, were all there writing uh, eight hours a day for three weeks, taking into account all the various uh, delegations, letters and writings and speeches, and forming up this response. And finally, they were presented on April 26, 1619, to the States General for approval. Imagine that, sending, uh, imagine us sending a confession of faith to the U.S. Senate. <laughs> Just a foreign world to us, isn't it? Uh, May 6, 1619, the delegates then process down the street to the Hrotkerk, the great church in Dordrecht, uh, for a public reading of the, of the canons in Dutch. And they were read in Dutch because they were read to the public. The public had a ga two galleries, in fact, in the back of the room uh, to be there. That's why that image has a dog in it. The little dog at the front, uh, the back of the synod, uh, actually. It, it was a public meeting, a public thing. And so uh, the delegates processed to the great church. Uh, they read these articles in Dutch, and then at the end of it, after each uh, signatory's, every delegate's name was read, uh, he, would, uh, he would tip his hat as a way of expressing consent and affirmation uh, to the canons. After the, all the foreign delegates left, uh, the English stuck around for the post-acta, and the synod dealt with their own church order issues and uh, formalizing the Heidelberg Catechism, Belgic Confession of Faith, uh, and as Dr. Piper mentioned, uh, they offered very godly, helpful advice and guidance on Sabbath uh, observance. Uh, it's interesting that uh, uh, it's the English delegates, the English delegates in Dortrecht, who complained about lack of Sabbath observance. Uh, and I might, you know, we might anachronistically call them the Anglican delegates, the English delegates, complained about the continental Dutch reformed. Uh, in fact, the Dutch, uh, some in the Netherlands, some unreformed people, called uh, this whole concept of Sabbath, the figmentum Anglicanum, the Anglican, the English figments, uh, sort of throwing it out of hand. But... Uh, this great statement on the Sabbath uh, shows the unity between the Reformed churches uh, in our various catechisms and confessions in our documents uh, that uh, the Sabbath is an abiding principle of worship and rest. So, Weistreiden for de Dordselier, amdat dia es van God de hier. We fight for the doctrine of Dort. Our forefathers fought a long, protracted battle over these five small points on a sheet of paper. They fought, they fought for the doctrines of the word of God. And the question for us, of course, is will you, will I, will we fight too in our time and place for the gospel of Jesus? Let's pray. We praise you, our merciful, gracious, patient God, that you put up with us sinners. All of our fighting, our infighting, our strife, our struggles, our disbelief of the things that you reveal to us in your word, our rationalizations, our accommodations. Yet you've promised that you sent your son to this world to build a church and that the gates of hell themselves shall not prevail. We confess by faith that I believe a holy Catholic church. And Lord, we pray that you would give us that faith to believe the church is your body, your bride, holy in your sight, despite our weaknesses. Keep us strong though. Grant us preservation of the faith and perseverance in it so that we might be enabled to preach it and preaching it to see sinners saved 
and sinners saved, Lord, to see our nation uh, return to you. We ask all this in Jesus' name and all of God's people say, Amen. Amen.